We're in for a great conversation coming up now about the future of American cities. And there's so much to consider in a discussion like this. Public safety, taxes and spending, housing and affordability, and many other issues. Moderating this next panel will be my friend and colleague, Neil Mahoney, who, as we announced earlier today, will be taking over my job as the director, Trioni director of CEPR, uh, exactly 10 months from today, on January 1st, 2025. So it is, and please, uh, let's give a round of applause to Neil for stepping up for this. And I think it's terrific that he is here with us today uh, to get uh, some training for what it's like to spend uh, some time on the stage during the CEPR Economic Summit. And I have no doubt that he will uh, more than outdo me in when, he's, uh, when he's in my position. So some of you, uh, uh, I want to make a brief introduction though of Neil. I know you, you've heard a little bit about him perhaps this morning, but he is a professor of economics here at Stanford and the, George P, the first ever George P. Schultz Fellow at CEPR. From 2022 to 2023, Neil was a special policy advisor for economic policy in the White House National Economic Council. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an affiliated professor at JPAL. Neil's research interests are in healthcare and consumer financial markets. He received the uh, Ash Econ Medal from the American Society of Health Economists in 2021, which is given the award given to an economist age 40 or under who has made the most significant contributions to the field of health economics. He also received a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2016. Before joining Stanford, Neil was a professor of economics and D David G. Booth faculty fellow at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He also was a Robert Wood Johnson Fellow in Health Policy Research at Harvard University and worked for the Obama administration on healthcare reform. I'm really delighted that Neil is here with us today and I'm looking forward to his conversation with this next set of panelists whom, and he will introduce all three panelists. So uh, take it away, Neil. Thank you, Mark. I should have sent you a note to manage expectations, but uh, you have to work with the hand you've been dealt. Uh, so uh, this session, turn on the TV or you know, scroll through TikTok or Instagram, and you'll see a parade of videos about cities in crisis, homeless encampments, open air drug markets, retail theft. Uh, Office values in many central business districts have cratered, uh, and there's a risk that they will never return. If you look at the data, many of our country's most iconic cities, New York, LA, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington, Boston, are losing population. American cities, according to the narrative, are in decline. Is the situation really that dire? What is the path forward? How can we make the path forward better? Uh, I'm delighted to say we have the ideal panelists for this discussion. Uh, Ed Glazier is a professor of economics and chair of the Department of Economics at Harvard. He is the world's leading scholar of cities, the leading scholar in the field of urban economics. He's written countless influential papers that I have read that I teach, including those on cities as fundamental engines of economic growth, the harms of segregation. Uh, he's written seminal work on how zoning pushes up housing prices in the coastal cities in which many of us have lived. Ed has written four books, including The Magisterial Triumph of the City, uh, which I strongly recommend. He's a great teacher and mentor uh, including to me in a, in a workshop uh, he ran for Young Scholars when I was a postdoc. Uh, our second panelist, Matt Mahan, is the 66th mayor of San Jose, elected in November 2022 to a two-year term. Uh, I think as many in this audience know, San Jose is the 12th uh, most populous city in the United States. The San Jose metro area ranks at the top of the US list of GDP per capita, and in the top three of metro areas in the world. Uh, just as importantly, perhaps more importantly, San Jose is a remarkable engine for economic mobility. 
uh, Raj Chetty and his co-authors in their studies of upward mobility in the United States. They've looked at every city, and San Jose ranks first in the fraction of the population who is born in the bottom 20% of the distribution and makes it to the top 20% of the distribution. That rate at 12.9% is three times hi higher than in some districts uh, in the United States. It's nearly twice as high as average. Uh, like his city, uh, Mayor Mahan has impressive stats. Uh, he worked as a teacher for Teach for America. Uh, he is the founder and executive of two tech companies focused on civic engagement. Uh, his only flaw is that he went to Harvard. <laughs> uh, DA Jenkins is the 31st district attorney of San Francisco. Uh, and I think it's not a stretch to say that she has one of the hardest jobs in America. San Francisco, as we all know, is known as a beacon for tolerance and progressive activism. It is also a poster child for the problems of retail theft, homelessness, and open air drug use. DA Jenkins is a unique talent with the capabilities and experience to meet this challenge. She grew up uh, just across the bay from here in Union City. She attended Berkeley and U Chicago Law School. She spent nearly a decade as an assistant DA in San Francisco, working her way up from the misdemeanors unit to sexual assault and the homicide unit. She is blazing a trail that balances the progressive impulse for tolerance with an understanding of the broad-based desire to stand up to harden criminals and clean up our streets. Uh, I cannot be impartial. I'm 100% rooting on her to succeed. All right, so here's the roadmap for the next hour or so. Uh, I'm gonna invite the speakers to give opening remarks of about seven minutes. Uh, then I have some questions and then I will open it up to better questions from all of you. Ed. It's great to be here. Uh, in fact, some of the ideas that I'm talking about here were worked out here at Stanford uh, in 1994, uh, where I, I spent a year. And in fact, I'm very grateful to Sieper because it was at Sieper lunches that I actually got to know Paul Krugman and actually learned things from him which will appear in this, in this lecture today. We are at an amazing moment for cities. We're at a moment in which, to some people, it seems like an existential threat that we have technologies that enable us to communicate in, in cyberspace. And it seems as if perhaps the physical interactions and the cities that enable those interactions are headed for the trash heap of history. Luckily, this is not the first time technology has interacted with cities. Over thousands of years, there has been a dance between centripetal technologies that pull us together and centrifugal technologies that push us apart that have shaped our urban areas and have shaped humanity's own course. The aqueduct, of course, is one of the great centripetal technologies of all time that enabled the urbanization of Rome and of much of the, uh, the world for the last 2,000 years. In the 19th century, we experienced a great centripetal technology phase where technologies like the skyscraper and the railroad made it possible for cities to expand their global reach and for them to reach towards the sky. The 20th century was a much more centrifugal century, a century in which transportation technologies and Communicating, communications technologies like radios and televisions ended up leveling the playing field, enabled the growth of suburbs, enabled the growth of non-urban areas, enabled mobility on the part of far-flung farmers. It was a period in which transportation costs plummeted, in which America's older, colder cities that had been built around transportation technology, they hemorrhaged jobs. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And this cluster lost hundreds of thousands of jobs over a 10-year period in the 1960s. This evolution meant that by the 1970s, People were wondering, and Alvin Toffler wrote The Third Wave in 1980, where he speculated that just as container ships and highways had ended New York's garment sector, he speculated that the information technology of his age, right, this would have been uh, fax machines and, and early personal computers, they would turn cities into graveyards. They would lead skyscrapers to be empty buildings, perhaps usable for storage space. The words of his books are eerily reminiscent of today. 
right? Now, the logic was impeccable. Why would we need to be face to face when we could just fax each other, right? But of course, for 39 of the last 44 years, he was completely and totally wrong. Right? Cities have enjoyed a tremendous renaissance during this period of information technology. Right? And I think the reason for this it is, is that it's far from obvious that information technology replaces the need for face-to-face -face interactions. In many cases, information technology creates a more personally interactive world. So this is an image from Michael Bloomberg's City Hall, which is based on uh, Michael Bloomberg's company, his, his bullpen and his company, his Wallace office, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor where he, he worked earlier. What's going on on trading floors? Here you have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who in a normal industry would sit ensconced in large offices, but they're right there on top of each other, sweating on each other, getting guacamole on each other, if, if Michael Lewis is to be believed, right? The whole thing is chaos. Why are they there? Because in their industry, knowledge is more important than space. And what all of this technological change did was they just made knowledge more and more valuable. And we are a social species that gets smart by being amidst smart people. Right? It's how Stanford works. It's how Silicon Valley works. It's how the world works. Um, if information technology was so deadly to face-to-face -to -face, uh, contact, why is it that the most famous example of ge a geographic cluster in the world today is right here? Right, is this epicenter of, of new technology? Why is it that so much of AI is clustered in one narrow corner of San Francisco? Right? Technological change doesn't make face-to-face -face contact obsolete. It only ups the need for us to become as smart as possible by being around other smart people. The more complicated an idea is, the easier it is for that idea to get lost in translation. Right? And we have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Right? Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your class. Anything you're saying is going through to your audience. And again, it's the cues that you get from the audience that teach you when you're screwing up. Now, of course, not all cities managed to come back after the 1980s. Skilled cities come back. And this just shows population growth and initial population share, initial population with a college degree. Skilled cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, managed to reinvent themselves. Right? Detroit, Cleveland did not. It's easy to forget now, but in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Because just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. Right? And Boeing had been cutting back on jobs. This is before Amazon, before Costco, before Starbucks, before any of the amazing things that have happened and have reinvented, uh, reinvented uh, Seattle. Microsoft. This is an image from MIT, from Kendall Square. Again, another reinvention around information. Now, and so we face the, the world today. We face a world, this is Castle Technologies, this is the share of people going to work relative to the pre-pandemic. All of these fancy downtown office markets still remarkably empty. Is this permanent or is this temporary? One of the things that makes San Francisco so problematic is in fact the very skills that made it strong before the pandemic. Those skills made it much easier to work remotely. In May 2020, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were working remotely. 5% of high school dropouts were working remotely. A very disparate thing. And that also explains this graph, which I find an absolutely amazing graph. This just shows the total death rate from COVID and skills at the metropolitan area level. It's not surprising because it's negative. It's surprising because the least educated places have death rates that are four times those of the most educated places. Right? That partially reflects the fact that in cities like San Francisco, they could just shelter in place. It is important that you not think that this world of, of remote work is all that common in the US. So this shows CPS data of what share of Americans are working remotely some hours and all, and all hours. This does not come from an online survey, and so it's something that's much more trustable. Um, this is about a quarter of Americans have some advantage in this. So three quarters of Americans are not, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you think about the importance of this in the long run. Um, we have a number of studies, the best of them and the earliest of them done by the great Nick Bloom here at Stanford on the consequences of remote work for, for productivity. This is a, a, an image from the work of Natalia Manuel and Emma Harrington, two former students of ours. They show exactly the same thing as Nick's survey does. Send call center workers home, they are just as productive as making calls in the short run. But their probability of being promoted drops by 50%. True in Nick's study, true in their study. 
right? You lose the water cooler. You lose the ability to impress the boss. You lose the ability to learn from the people around you, right? Yes, we can get through it in the short run, but we lose it in the long run. This is a, a, from a paper that Sonia Jaffe and her co-authors did it at uh, Microsoft, which shows similarly a breakdown in synchronous communication and a siloing of knowledge networks within the, in the company as a result of remote work. If you ask me, I think that what Zoom ultimately means is not an end to face-to-face -face contact. In part, we're just human beings and we need it, we love it, right? But it does mean that talent has never been more mobile. And that means that you know, the work of the district attorney has never been more important because San Francisco needs to fight for talent, as does Boston, as does New York. All of these places that thought that their edge was permanent now need to fight for it. Above all, uh, you know, we have to start, start off with the fact that, that the warm parts of America have done much better. So if you were in the north, uh, that would be a, a problem. This is partially about nice weather and it's partially about what, which places are actually relatively pro-business, right? And which places make it easy to build housing. This is a problem for San Francisco. To me, I think of the sort of public policy side of it is the critical role of the consumer side of the equation. Amenities, quality of life, people actually wanting to live in your city. This is critical about health, it's about safety, it's about infrastructure. Three quick points. One, there is no substitute for safe streets, right? It is true that it is a tragedy that we solved the crime of the 1980s by locking up far too many young men. It is a tragedy that we treat far too many young men as if they were criminals when they haven't done anything wrong on the streets. That needs to be fixed. But at the same time, we need to keep our streets safe. And that is just as much of a civil rights issue as, as anything else. And two, housing affordability. Along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, is how much metropolitan areas build. Along the vertical axis is how expensive areas are. Places that are expensive don't build a lot. Places that build a lot aren't expensive. There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. San Francisco and the San Francisco region will never be affordable unless you build radically more housing than you are currently building, right? And this is a huge hold, uh, hold on, on, on the region. Third, infrastructure. I'm not gonna say anything about this, but there are great ways that we can use technology to target simple things like road repaving to make our cities, our cities better. And I will, ask, I will talk about that as you'll ask me later. But final point, right? Cities have been through worse. The 70s was actually worse. It was actually more of an existential threat. And you know what's really, really bad? Having your city blown to bit by enemy bombers. And yet, cities have come back then, and they will come back now. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to need him to come and give that presentation to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. <laughs> and maybe we'll start to fix some things. Um, no, I'm, I'm honored to be here. As some of you might know, uh, I came into the role of the District Attorney of San Francisco in a much different way than most uh, elected officials do. Um, we, in 2022, decided that the DA at the time um, was not fitting the bill and that he needed to be recalled. Um, as most people know, um, the climate in 20, 2019, especially 2020, after the death of George Floyd, really started a, a progressive movement that spawned a, a lot of feelings, right, about negative feelings, about law enforcement, about the criminal justice system, and Chesa Boudin was elected at a time when there was no more fervor uh, around these topics um, than we had really ever seen in this country. And so um, in that period, late 2019, when he was elected, uh, most of the concern of the constituents in San Francisco was about what were we doing to fix the problems within the criminal justice system. And we'd kind of seen waves of that over the, the, the last few decades in San Francisco in the DA's office. Uh, prior to Kamala Harris, um, we had a DA that was more progressive. Kamala Harris ran on a platform more public safety based and being smart on crime and became the next DA. Uh, then we had George Gascon who tried to blend uh, uh, you know, a mix of the progressive and the more uh, moderate view of, of public safety. And then we swung back to the left of, of a progressive, very progressive DA. Unfortunately, um, under the last DA, what happened uh, was that our city began to, of course, suffer. And the streets, for many reasons, including the fact that we were just simply not enforcing our laws, um, spiraled. And, and became intolerable for a city, as you said, built on tolerance. Um, and so I come into office under a mandate of cleaning things up uh, in 2022. 
One thing uh, that I said during that recall process, because I was a very vocal proponent of, of his recall, was that most people up until then did not associate public safety and the work of the district attorney's office with the economy. Uh, they saw it as simply your personal safety, but not the overall function of, of the city itself. But what we began to see was that businesses were beginning to close, that again, at a time when you needed workers to return for very obvious reasons into our downtown space, that they were refusing to do so, citing public safety concerns, not just for their personal safety, but for the safety of their vehicles when they would park them. Um, and so uh, what we saw was that rapid decline in our economy. When, when stores close, we receive less tax revenue. When people won't come into work, our restaurants suffer. D d things like dry cleaners and coffee shops can't function. And so again, we just saw this problem begin to explode um, more and more as a, as a ripple effect. Um, the, com the value of commercial buildings began to plummet. And so that began to bring the real estate, uh, those who, who own commercial real estate, into the fold of being far more interested, again, in public safety and the work of the district attorney's office. Um, I emphasized that issue because what we have to understand in San Francisco is that in order to provide all of those wonderful services that many of our residents believe should be provided to those in need, our city must have revenue. Um, and so I, I worked hard to tie those two things together. But fundamentally, if we don't have public safety, I, I emphasize that that beautiful view of the Bay is not enough to sustain us. Uh, I often say we can easily become Baltimore or Detroit. And not just for the simple fact that we have a concentration of, of a certain industry uh, within uh, our city, but because people want safe streets, they want clean streets, they want to raise their children in an environment that promotes positive values. And if we can't provide that, then people can, will, will leave, especially for somewhere that is more affordable. And so um, everything that I have been trying to do is to bring that, that sense of, of pragmatism into the equation in San Francisco to say, if we're not practical about the way that we all do our work in city government, uh, this city will fail and it will remain vacant. Uh, we have seen commercial buildings literally drop in value by three, threefold. Uh, buildings that sold for over $200 million a decade ago, um, selling for 60. And that is a problem. Um, and so for me, I have two small children, they're seven and four. Uh, I, I oftentimes put on the lens of being a parent in San Francisco and explaining to those who often oppose the work that I do and, and don't feel that um, the DA's office has a, has a place in trying to address some of the issues that are on our streets related to mental health issues and, and substance use, that I as a mother don't want my children to grow up in a city where they are taught that smoking fentanyl on the street is something normal. Smoking fentanyl at all is something normal, let alone doing it in public. I don't want to raise my children in a city that teaches you that if you walk into Target or Walgreens, that you're allowed to take whatever you want and walk out. And if I don't want that for mine, I certainly understand that no one else should want it for theirs. And so it's my job to come in and to, yes, emphasize that we have reforms that need to take place within this system. We have to make sure that the system is equitable and is fair and that justice is delivered on all sides, but it, but it cannot come at the expense of public safety. We have to be able to balance those two um, to have a functioning society. And so we've seen a, a, a massive shift in San Francisco over the last couple of years that uh, while there is still a very vocal faction who um, is, is for the status quo, uh, the majority of San Franciscans want things to improve. They want to have our laws enforced. They don't want to have to uh, ask for an employee to come over and unlock the cabinet for you to purchase toothpaste or Tide Pods, right? That they want to make sure that when they walk down the street um, that they're not encountered by a mentally ill person who is violent and, and unpredictable. And in order for us to attract visitors to our city, we have to make it inviting. 
We must. It can't be that you're, fe you're fearful of being robbed or having your car window broken into. Um, it, it has to be a city that attracts not only people to live, but people to visit because it's the only thing that's going to sustain our economy. And so that's what I've been trying to do is be that rational voice amongst um, some folks who, who aren't always rational, but uh, I, I think that the silent majority in San Francisco agrees with me. Well, good afternoon. I'm Matt Mahan, Mayor of San Jose. Really thrilled to be here with you all day. We have a lot in common in our political philosophies. I also have a six and four year old, so we'll have to get our kids together yeah. sometime. But uh, it's great to finally meet you and to, to be on this panel. Uh, you know, I'll just share a few quick introductory thoughts, and then I want to get to the, the great questions I know we have lined up. Um, first, I'll say I'm very bullish on cities in general and San Jose in particular, but it's worth noting that we face some significant challenges in government at all levels, and I think we're going to have to evolve the way that government functions if we're going to tackle our challenges head on and come out better on the other side. I'm bullish on cities in general for the very reasons that Professor Glazer already gave. I think one way of looking at the entire march of human history is a process of urbanization. Of, of greater concentration, amalgamation, and, and density because of all the opportunity and creativity and innovation and productivity that comes when you get people together in, in a dense format. I experienced that myself. I grew up in a small farming town on the central coast, a little town called Watsonville, where uh, your strawberries are from, and uh, not a whole lot else, great place to grow up. But um, when it was time for high school, I ended up commuting over this mountain range of the Santa Cruz Mountains to get to a Catholic prep school in San Jose because it just offered more opportunity. And I fell in love with San Jose for the reasons that Professor Mahoney outlined, a city that is incredibly diverse, more than really I think any other city in the country, if not the world, has welcomed people from all over and created immense upward mobility. <coughs> we are over 40% foreign born in San Jose. We have more patents per capita than any other city in the country. 57% of our households speak a language other than English at home. We are truly where Silicon Valley's workforce calls home. We, are the, we were built as the bedroom community to the job centers here closer to Stanford, and we continue to play that role in addition to having world-class companies like Adobe and Zoom headquartered and Cisco and PayPal and many others uh, in, our, in our city. I'm very bullish on our potential as a city because we are also politically very pragmatic and, and have that, that moderate pragmatic sensibility that the DA just spoke to. We, in fact, I ran, despite not having any endorsements and being outspent by $3 million a couple years ago, on a message of getting back to basics, focusing on fewer things like public safety, getting people housed faster, cleaning up the city, speeding up permitting, not the sexiest of issues, but an important one, as Professor Glazer will tell you, and one on this notion of basically bringing performance management to government. I think you can only do that in a city that calls itself the capital of Silicon Valley, but the idea that we should actually set goals when we pass a budget and identify where tax dollars are going, which programs, which policies that are intended to actually move the needle on an issue and then measure the performance of those programs and demonstrate whether or not we as policymakers can fund the initiatives and the policies that actually do improve outcomes. We should be more outcome focused in government. And I think San Jose is poised to lead that reinvention of government, to go back to a term that was commonly used in the 90s. But I think that's especially necessary and perhaps we have an opportunity to embrace that new way of operating in government because we face some crises. We have challenges that far outstrip our capacity to solve them if we keep doing things the same way. Homelessness being a great example of this. Our primary approach to ending homelessness has been building brand new apartments at a cost of a million dollars the door. In fact, we have literally approved affordable housing projects in San Jose, and we're not alone, that have come in 
at $1.2 million a door worth of public subsidy to, in some cases, ultimately get one person off the streets. Those projects are taking five or six years to build. And I've been an advocate for certainly sequel reform and streamlined permitting, but also modular construction, opening up government-owned land, having a whole spectrum of solutions. We've stood up interim housing. I don't want to get too deep into some of the topics I know we're going to get into, but counter to the trend in the state of California, San Jose saw a 10% reduction in unsheltered homelessness year over year, largely because we embraced modular units on government-owned land that could be built in a year at about one-tenth the cost and got people indoors faster. So I think that there are, and, and I won't, we're going to get into some of these issues in more detail, I think that we can deliver better outcomes for the dollars we have, and I think we're going to have to because of the fiscal challenges we face. The state of California is facing a $70 billion plus deficit, it looks like. Our county here has about a $400 million deficit. San Jose has a small deficit. But we also have the accumulation of years of fiscal mismanagement, frankly. Just to give you the numbers from San Jose, and we're one of the better managed cities in the state of California, our general fund takes a 17% hit every single year right off the top to pay for our unfunded pension liabilities. We've got a billion dollars in redevelopment debt that we still have to pay off. We have a billion and a half of deferred maintenance on infrastructure. So we've spent a lot of time kicking the can down the road fiscally, and I'm not trying to, again, I think our city's probably better managed than many. And yet, when you look at public finances in the fiscal situation, the chickens are finally coming home to roost. And it's going to force us to be more focused, to be more pragmatic in the solutions we pursue, and to squeeze more productivity, more impact out of the limited public dollars we have. And so that's what I'm really try trying to drive us to do in San Jose around those four key pillars of being the safest big city in America, ending street homelessness, cleaning up the city, and speeding up permitting. And I want to stay focused on those basics, on those foundational issues, because I believe that if we get those things right, if we lead the region and the nation in our performance in those four areas, I think it's going to open up the economic growth and expand the tax base to allow us to do all the other things we want to do but can't afford to do, like longer library hours, better parks, more after-school programs, and all these other things that I would love to be able to fund today, but frankly can't. So I'll, I'll maybe pause there, because I know we're going to go deeper into some of these policy areas. But thanks again for having me. No. Uh, thank you, Professor, DA, and Mayor. I think this is a great start. I, I do want to go deeper on some of these topics, but also want to leave time for questions for the audience. Uh, Ed, I know you're an optimist. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you're an optimist. I want to spend a few more minutes dwelling on sort of the risk factors. And so if, let's say, this decade is a lost decade for cities, you know, and you're, you're writing your next book in, in 2030 about where we went wrong, what do you think would be sort of the, the key arguments in, in that piece? What do you, as a lover of cities, what keeps you up at night? Well, I think it's exactly the issues that we've been we've been raising. I mean, uh, you know, part of the, the the challenge that cities face is that the in 2019 there was a widespread progressive belief that cities had gone terribly wrong, right? So when I wrote my book Triumph of the City, we were sort of coming off of the post 1970s, post 1980s urban reinvention. There was a pragmatic consensus where sort of everyone believed that the things that you've just heard from these remarkable public servants were the things that city governments needed to do. Over the past 10 years, right before, before COVID hit, there was a widespread sense in that cities had lost their way. And let's just go through a couple of them. One, they were underperforming in turning poor kids into prosperous adults. So we had a, a series of evidence suggesting that when you came to, to cities as a 25-year-old, you did great. But if you grew up in a city, right, San Jose is in fact an exception, but it's a, it's a rare one, right, cities are not good at, at turning poorer kids, or at least they weren't good in Raj Chetty's data around 1980 into uh, higher income adults. Much of that is the failure of urban public school systems. Much of this is found, you really see this break, just kids who live one uh, quarter of a mile right outside big city uh, school districts versus inside, really huge differences in your upward mobility, huge differences in your probability of being incarcerated as an adult. Two, the housing affordability problem. Cities and suburbs turned into machines for protecting the interests of insiders and keeping outsiders out. 
And so we had an incredible increase in housing prices, but an elimination of housing affordability, right? A second failure. Third, the fact that we you know, seem to ignore the need of, needs of the, the people who were potentially uh, you know, being treated by, by cops as criminals, and we locked up millions of people, and we, we did make our city safer, but not one that was actually sensitive to the way the people in the neighborhood was, were, were experiencing that. And so all of these things created a progressive wave. That progressive wave felt eerily reminiscent to me of what we experienced in the mid-1970s, when there was similarly a sense in which you know, cities should be solving these long-standing, very real social wrongs. The problem is in the 1970s, that wave hit just at the time in which businesses and rich people became more mobile because of, of highways, because of suburbs, because of container ships, and you had this massive urban crisis because this progressive wave just pushed them out. This is what I fear today. The progressive wave runs into Zoom. Okay, the regressive wave hits at a moment in which it could not, we just passed a millionaire's tax in Massachusetts, which is insane. Okay, Massachusetts is basically like a large metropolitan area, and talent is very mobile out of, out of, out of Massachusetts. There's nothing innately good about our, you know, our location other than cranberry box. Okay, there's nothing that naturally keeps people in this, in this metro area, and yet we decided we're going to tax our richest individuals and see, whether, see how much damage we do to the economy by doing that. All right. Um, so this is, this is exactly uh, what, I'm, what I'm worried about. And I think eventually, right, we'll catch on. Eventually we'll understand that this is just too dangerous, that you cannot go around treating your golden goose as if something you can keep hacking at the neck at and it'll be okay. Uh, but I just hope it won't take three election cycles. <laughs> uh, I have a more specific question for you, uh, Mayor Mahan, which is about sort of the, the hollowing out of central business districts and you know, the decrease in uh, commercial property prices. Uh, my guess is that has a big impact on city budgets and will have implications on the services that cities can uh, provide. I'd love to hear more about how you in your role are, are thinking about these issues and how cities can respond. Yeah, it's a great question. There's no doubt that the uh, likely uh, reassessment of commercial property in downtown cores is, is gonna have a significant fiscal impact. I, I think for many cities in California, it's likely to be not this fiscal year, there'll be some impact, but it'll probably be more significant the following fiscal year, though we are already seeing more and larger deficits across the state. Um, you know, we're seeing an interesting thing happen in our downtown. The commercial vacancy rates, like virtually all other big cities in our downtown in San Jose, are over 30%, which is, which is very significant and puts those commercial properties under serious uh, stress. And I think you will see reassessments and that will eventually hit our revenues in the public sector. However, when you look at foot traffic and sales tax revenue in our downtown core, it is back to pre-pandemic level. And in fact, San Jose has had the fastest rebounding downtown in terms of those, those factors, foot traffic in particular, of, of any city in California, third fastest rebound in the state. But if you slice the data, this is largely based on mobile phone data, it's completely shifted. It's not the office worker who's back. The nine to five Monday through Friday is very depressed from where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, in the pre-pandemic era, but the evenings, particularly Thursday, Friday, and then weekends are much higher than they were. And so what we seem to be seeing, at least in San Jose, but I, I think this is broadly true, is back to this point that Professor Glazer made, we're social animals. We, we want to be together. We want to have experiences, social experiences together. We want to uh, you know, be in a face-to-face -face environment and break bread together. Um, what we're seeing is maybe the office, at least as currently imagined, is not the most compelling place, at least not enough to get you out of bed at 5.30 to go sit in traffic for an hour to have that social experience. But dinners, the arts, music festivals, conferences, unique social events and experiences, we're calling it the experience economy, is rebounding massively. And it's not even necessarily filling up hotel rooms. A lot of it is actually regional and local. It's people going downtown for dinner. It's, um, it's, it's people maybe doing a staycation. Uh, we're seeing our convention center fill up again. And so I think we're seeing a shift to more of an experience economy. A major focus for us will be getting greater residential density in our downtown. We need to increase the consistent foot traffic and customer base. We need more wallets living 
in downtown. And I think that rather than seeing this resurgence driven by the rebound of the commercial market, I think it's gonna be experiences and events and residential density that then creates an environment where suddenly workers eventually say, hey, that's a cool spot. There's a lot going on there. Maybe I do wanna go back to the office three or four days a week. And we're actually seeing that around our, I'll stop on this, but our big retail center, Santana Row Valley Fair, probably the most successful retail area in at least the Bay Area, if not, in, if not nationally in the last couple of years especially. We're seeing more employers move there because it's where their employees are already hanging out nights and weekends. So I think it's really, there's really gonna be a premium placed on the environment and the experience you can create around the workplace. So I don't, I don't know if I fully answered your question there. But. I think that was super helpful. Uh, I wanna pick up on sort of what DA Jenkins was talking about. I think laid out a very convincing argument on the potential vicious circle between uh, crime and the economy. And uh, so given that risk, I guess the natural question is, uh, what can we do? What are you doing? Uh, you know, what are the impediments to uh, stopping you know, this you know, cycle of, of uh, you know, the flight of, of businesses? Macy's you know, moved out of Union Square, is moving out of Union Square. That's obviously a national de decision, but I think feeds into a narrative uh, and so what can we do? What's the case uh, for stopping the cycle in San Francisco? Well, I, I think just like Mayor Mahan said, we have to get back to basics. And that was a part of um, the discussion that I had all around San Francisco is uh, we took for granted the fundamentals, right? Um, when government is functioning well and, and our garbage is being picked up at Thursday, on Thursdays at 8 a.m. and the, the potholes, you know, there's no potholes in your street and, and things are functioning, most people just rest, right? And you trust government is doing what they need to do. Um, it's when you start to see and be impacted by the fact that it's not functioning well that we all awaken. And, and that beast has awoken uh, because we have to get back to the basics of doing our jobs. We have to make sure that we are enforcing all laws. I, I often say all crime is illegal again in San Francisco. And <laughs> that's, that's generally the, res the response is that, <laughs> You know, it's, I, I say that to be funny, but also to be very serious. Um, we as district attorneys don't have the right to decriminalize certain things. Um, that's the job of the legislature and, and the voters to weigh in on. Um, we must enforce our laws. That is the only way that we are going to deal with that basic problem of people doing drugs on our street, of people stealing, of people getting robbed and breaking into cars. Um, I think what we have seen is, again, when I was paying attention as a younger prosecutor to other jurisdictions in our region, um, you saw a different level of support <laughs> by residents um, for law enforcement doing their jobs. Um, particularly Santa Clara County is, is very notable. Um, they invest in making sure that they have the highest paid prosecutors um, in, the, in the Bay Area, that they, again, give them the resources to do their jobs, and that has not been the case in San Francisco up until now. Um, but I do feel like those winds have shifted. Um, a part of the problem that I encounter is that some of these problems, while can be criminal, also may not be. Um, so when we're talking about encampments, when we're talking about folks who are struggling with substance abuse disorder, when we talk about the mass number of people in San Francisco that suffer from mental health disorders, uh, they may cross into right becoming a, a criminal issue because they've committed a crime, or they may not. Um, and so when they are not yet in the criminal justice system, I have to rely upon other agencies within the city to do their part to intervene. And so um, public health officials, when it comes to those who, again, are struggling with, with mental health issues and with substance abuse, um, when it comes to encampments, making sure that our Department of Public Works goes out and even despite our injunction, enforces uh, those issues the way that they can and are permitted to. And when those agencies are more ideological than they are pragmatic, when they won't simply do their jobs, 
it makes it much, much more difficult for me to see success even when I am enforcing the law. And so that's a big part of the issue in San Francisco. Um, one of the things that I will say in Valley Fair Mall is the highest grossing Westfield Mall in the country. I, I, I do know that from them telling us that right before our Westfield Mall uh, decided to no longer exist, basically. Um, <laughs> but you know, I often talk in San Francisco about the fact that when you go to Valley Fair Mall, which I, I like to, um, it is an experience. It, it very much is an experience. He touched the nail right on the head. You feel comfortable, you feel welcomed. It actually makes you want to spend your money. When you come to Westfield Mall in San Francisco, you do not have that feeling. You, you smell things that you don't want to smell. You encounter people <laughs> that you don't want to encounter. You park in a garage that makes you question whether or not you will come back to your car looking the same way. That does not entice people into our city. It does not, and when they don't come, even residents don't come, right, let alone visitors, um, to shop, well then that has an impact on stores staying in their bottom lines. And so we have to get back to those basics of creating an environment that is attractive to people so that we can be competitive. And right now, because we're not all rowing in the same direction, we can't create that, in, that competitive environment. Uh, so I, I want to switch to the topic of homelessness and want to uh, basically dig it a little bit deeper on what the mayor is doing in uh, San Jose. So, you know, data, at the, HUD data, uh, and I think our everyday experiences show that California is experiencing a homelessness crisis. California is spending more money on homelessness, uh, but resources are finite and the trends are getting worse, not better. Uh, so, you know, I think great to hear more about what you're doing in San Jose to try and thread the needle between solutions and not blowing up the budget. Uh, and I would love to hear about, you know, why we were building million dollar homes with, to house one person before uh, and how that can be avoided moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know how many hours you all have, but um, <laughs> I'll try to be quick. I mean, look, I, I think that, let me start with this. Are you all familiar with the concept of housing first? Okay, so here's the basic insight. This came from a couple of decades ago. You know, it, it for years was the case, and on so many of these issues, it's kind of like the pendulum swings too far, and then we realize, oh, there's an unintended consequence, right? Maybe we should swing back a little bit. But, you know, it was the case for years that we had this sort of tough love approach that said, hey, if you want to earn housing, you need to deal with your addiction and get a job. And, you know, I don't have any problem with that. Again, I told you I grew up out in the country. But, uh, you know, the reality is most people weren't able to do that when they were living in a tent down by the creek. And Housing First had a very important insight. It said, get somebody indoors, stabilized, give them some privacy, dignity, and stability, and then get them connected to services, and you get a way better outcome rate. You, you, you find that 80 plus percent of people will get to the, out, to the outcome you want, versus the 20 percent who do when you condition housing on dealing with those things. So there was a key insight there that was important. But then, in the broader spectrum of, of California's public policy failures, we totally mangled the idea and somehow came to the conclusion that the only way to implement housing first was to build brand new publicly subsidized housing that by the time you get through environmental review, do all the community meetings, get the historical preservation check off, pay all the impact fees, put together the entire financing stack, you're spending a million dollars a door. So we're doing this in the most expensive, least scalable way. And that is how we in California have somehow decided to interpret housing first. And I just reject that interpretation of how, housing first. So I think we need to really focus on two ends of the spectrum. We need to unleash the market at one end and get back into the business. We need to unbreak the housing production market. We created for some of the reasons I just listed, and we may come, have time to come back around to this, we made it very difficult and expensive to build housing in the state of California. And so it used to be, I mean, you look historically, 97% of the housing in the state of California was built by the private marketplace. There was a growing economy, growing workforce, there was demand, and so private capital flowed to meet that demand and built the housing. And then government could step in for those who were really on the margin and were the highest need. 
we've broken the housing production market. Professor Glazer can say a lot more on this than I can. The other end of this, so we need to fix that. That's CEQA reform, that's, you know, dealing, that, that's, you know, right to repair rather than being, you know, constr having construction defect liability that extends out a decade because the paint fainted, faded. I mean, it's, it's really getting into the weeds of all the cost drivers. It's capping cities' ability to charge impact fees. It's, it's a whole bunch of things. It's ministerial approval, it's zoning. Okay, so that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, keep the core inside of housing first. Create safe, managed, dignified places for people to go. Figure out how to do it for ten dollars to $100,000 a door, which we're doing, prefab modular units on public land, for example. I don't think even congregate shelter should be a dirty word, frankly, though nobody in California wants to use that term anymore. We're even looking at safe sleeping. We're building safe parking sites for RVs. I mean, we've got to find scalable solutions. So you get people out of unmanaged encampments, which costs us $65,000 per person per year to manage people in tent encampments out there, get them into something safe, managed, and dignified and connected to services with basic sanitation, security, and case management, unlock the private marketplace to give you volume, build a heck of a lot of housing over here to start to bring down costs, and stop putting your limited public dollars in the middle here, subsidizing million dollar a door apartments to help the lucky few where well, we leave 150,000 people to die in a tent down by the creek. So that's, that's I mean, basically what I'm arguing for is, we, and we're trying to do this in San Jose, but unless we get our counties and our state, and frankly HUD back in Washington, to push us to go in this direction, we're gonna continue with most of our public dollars in California building million dollar apartments while we leave most people to die on the streets. So we, we have to be radically more pragmatic when you just look at the back of the envelope math. So, anyway. We have the world's expert on uh, barriers to building housing. I don't know, Ed, if, if you had anything to add. He's right. <laughs> what, what he's saying is right. Uh, I, I, if, I, if I'm going to add one thing that sort of it is an amazing fact in terms of the productivity of, of the housing industry. So, so from 1950 to 1970, uh, construction firms spent a fair amount of R&D and construction became more productive. After 1970 in the country as a whole, that completely reversed. Spending on R&D and construction went down, construction firms got smaller, projects got smaller. And in some sense, this is the add-on of all of these rules that mean you're doing one-by-one one units. Is It's not just that that individual unit gets worse. It's that you replace having a large-scale large, large scale mass production of housing that yields the possibility of actually figuring out new production technologies with mom-and-pop pop operations. And it's exactly right. We need to move back to, to a world in which we take advantage of scale economies, in which you come up with new ideas, in which we mass produce if we're going to make this stuff cheaper. And I think, you know, this is a great place to do it. Can I expound on one thing related to this topic? Because in San Francisco, of course, there's a housing first uh, 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 mindset. But what gets lost in that discussion is once someone is indoors, what the belief system is about them taking advantage of resources. Because at the same time that we have hou a housing first mentality that right, adopts the belief that once you get them indoors, right, things will magically come together for them. Uh, we also have an ideology that is very much harm reduction based that says, but we also shouldn't push you to fix your issues. We should let you do that as you wish on your own timeline. And so what happens is that you might, you might give the person the keys to that, to that unit, but you're doing nothing at the same time to ensure, again, some level of accountability that they actually address the behaviors that had taken them to the street. And so therefore, they carry around those keys and still sleep on our sidewalks, right? And so um, I think when we're thinking of, of all these different models, we still have to see the large picture, right? Look at it from a 30,000 foot view to say, you have to adopt other belief systems that, that actually make that model successful. Because I think, again, that data might be accurate in one sense, but in my jurisdiction, um, when they abandon the actual help that the person needs to sustain it, it's, it's not a working model. 
Totally, and all the more reason then to get people stabilized faster in a basic small modular unit and then bring in contingency management and let people actually stick to a program and, and kind of build their way to something better rather than just handing them the brand new million dollar apartment. Yeah. Great, so uh, what I wanna do now is sort of open it up for questions from the audience. Mark, I might ask you to help. Um, Pick. Who's got a question? Who's got a John question? Donahue's got a question, and then Vic Trioni. And then I'll look back over here. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I've been teaching a course on firearm regulation this year, and I ask all of the Stanford students to list the states uh, by uh, violent crime rates or murder rates. And I say, which state uh, between California, New York, and Texas has the lowest and highest murder rates? And all of the Stanford students practically will say, Texas has the lowest, California's in the middle, and New York is the highest. And of course, it's exactly wrong. Uh, New York has the lowest, California's in the middle, and Texas has the highest murder rate. And talking about cities, uh, the murder rate in Houston, Texas would be five times that of San Jose, or three times that of San Francisco. The violent crime rate in Houston would be twice the violent crime rate of San Francisco. So it's not crime per se, it's, it's many of the urban amenities, and you alluded to those, but I do think people get a very inaccurate view of crime overall, and I think it's, it's dangerous in the way we talk about things sometimes. In fact, Texas used to have a lower murder rate than California, before it changed the laws that had been in place there from 1870 to 1995, where they prohibited guns on the street. And now, of course, it has a so-called constitutional carry. And so one of the things I'm concerned about is, as we address some of the issues that you talk about, uh, the Supreme Court is now trying to turn California and New York into something that looks like Texas with unlimited uh, carrying of guns. And I'm wondering if you think uh, that will be the next problem as we see many of the California and New York gun laws are about to be replaced. So we're dealing with that in San Francisco. Uh, we've had 500 plus applications come in for concealed carry permits to the Sheriff's Department and 500 plus into the Police Department. We're grappling with the Supreme Court's um, ruling. Of course, we have to comply, um, but there are massive concerns, right, in such a dense space, having that, you know, having people um, armed. We know that right now people have that heightened sense of, of a lack of security. We've already seen, to an extent, um, some vigilantism in San Francisco, and so that is a paramount concern. Um, that it could increase what actually is a relatively low murder rate um, when you compare us to other major cities around the country. Um, the only thing that I will challenge you on is this notion of perception versus reality. Um, when you're talking about such a dense city like San Francisco, um, these, these issues that we're seeing are very much in your face because we're, we're eight by eight, right? I was just in LA yesterday and I was driving through downtown LA and I said, why are we the poster child for everything that's wrong? I see so much of the same thing here, right? Um, encampments, graffiti, you know, homeless people coming into the restaurant I was in. I mean, it was, it was very much San Francisco-ish. Um, and, you know, I was having a conversation last night with somebody about that, and they said, well, LA is so much larger. So there are places you can go in LA where you don't see these issues, where you don't experience this in your face. It's very spread out. Um, and so the, rea the reality that we experience in San Francisco is that things are pretty bad because everywhere you turn, you're encountering, you know, it feels like you're encountering this issue. I have to drive through downtown to take my child to school. I have to get, you know, when I get off the Bay Bridge, I come right into this environment. Our mall, you know, the mall that is closing is right there, grounded in where many of these issues exist. And so it's not something you can get away from like you could in a Dallas or 
LA or somewhere else. I mean, in a sense, crime in San Francisco is sort of meant to maximize the economic harm that crime can do, right? In some sense, it's, so I, I'll take, give a Seattle example, right? It's not that Seattle necessarily has more open air fentanyl markets than Houston does. It may well have, have many less, but its open air fentanyl market is on Third Avenue between Pike and Pine in the core tourist area, right? That's madness. So uh, your point is exactly right, of course, John, but, but it also is true that for these cities that have basically said it's okay to have crime in our core downtowns and our core tourist areas, that's where it's doing really a huge amount of time. And I can promise you, Houston's Galleria doesn't feel like that, right? That's, that's a different thing. Okay, uh, Vic, question. Right, right here. Um, I'm the Trioni director, that's Trioni. <laughs> Uh, this, this question, I think, is directed to Edward. Uh, about 60 miles north of here, over the last three years, a uh, number of Silicon Valley investors have uh, garnered together about 10,000 acres of basically open grassland. And this fall, this will be on the, on the ballot for a brand new city, a city with uh, pedestrian-friendly, walk-to-schools, walk-to-employment, and a city of approximately 400,000 people. My question is, what's your thinking about the concept of a new city and, uh, and the future? I think I am basically on the side of any new housing in California anywhere. I think that's, that's, that's basically my starting, my starting point, okay? There are, I, I had a New York Times column on this maybe, uh, actually I think it was December 26th of last year. So there's no question that there were some ugly and unpleasant ways in which this land was, was assembled. Um, that's true for most large land assembly uh, operations everywhere in the world. Um, I will say that I would prefer it if it was closer to the core employment areas. Right? I think there are lots of reasons why you know, having a satellite city is less efficient, involves typically more environmental harm from, the, from transportation. But if you're not going to build closer, then you know, let's build further, further away. I mean, I cannot emphasize just how big the stakes are. Be you know, the most productive place on the planet is here. Okay? And throughout almost all of American history, being incredibly productive meant that millions of people came there and we're able to find opportunity there, and we're able to make the place more productive. I mean, think about Detroit in 1950. I mean, almost assuredly the most productive place on the planet, right? Because Silicon Valley, because this region has been hamstrung by, you know, inordinate land use regulations, it has done much less than it could. And what it has done is amazing, but it could have done a great deal more, especially for middle and lower income uh, Americans who could have found much more opportunity here than they have. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of California forever, and I, you know, I hope they, and I also hope they do a lot of modular housing there. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got a question uh, back, back here. I don't know, yeah, two, I guess two questions, but yeah. There are actually two, there are actually two questions from this table, uh, but I'll be the first. Um, just kind of building on that last question, uh, that last point, Professor, uh, how can we tap into the scale economies that you were referring to that have now gone away when zoning and permitting standards are balkanized across all of these various jurisdictions? Um, the, the road to zoning reform runs through state legislatures. So what, what has to happen if you're ever going to have this is the states are going to have to take some powers away from localities and to make areas where there's essentially as of right building using state rules which are, are common everywhere. That's, that is the most natural thing, whether or not, I'm not telling you that you're gonna get there politically, but that is the way that this happens, is that it actually becomes, there's a set, set of products that you can do, and it doesn't mean all the houses need to look the same, right? I mean, you know, Alfred Sloan cracked this idea that you didn't have to make all your cars, cars black 100 years ago when GM figured out how to have lots of different looking cars, right? You can have lots of individuality built in a mass-produced product, and we should be able to get there, but it needs to be one in which you can have, have a common set of rules across a whole number of jurisdictions, and it becomes possible to put down a lot of housing at once. And then right next to him, I think, was, or, or maybe, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, 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 Mayor, Mayor. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I was just gonna quickly add that I completely agree with everything the professor said. Um, I, a couple other thoughts, though, just quickly. One is, I would encourage those of us who want to see more housing built to encourage our representatives in Sacramento to start to create more carrots and sticks. I think that cities that want housing, like San Jose, should get more investment in infrastructure. We should, we should see a financial upside. There should be a race to the top approach to encouraging cities that want to be part of enabling California's future growth. 
And conversely, cities that don't, that want to opt out, should get less support from the state to pave their roads and maintain their parks and do all the other things that, uh, all the amenities that they want if they're not going to participate in the ongoing growth of our state. I think there, there should be incentives. The other thing I'll just briefly add is, even in cities like San Jose that are extremely pro-housing, the biggest barrier is actually cost of construction. It's not NIMBYism. We have, we have entitled 8,000 apartments in our downtown core that have, they're that sitting on a shelf because they can't get financing. Because the cost of labor and materials and the, the amount of time it's taken, the carrying costs on the land, the whole thing, when you add it all up, is so high that interest rates are going to have to come way down. We're going to have to cut our fees, and we're going to have to wait a long time for rents to come up, frankly, for these projects to pencil, even though we've said yes to every single market rate and affordable project that's come before the council in probably the last decade, certainly since I've been on the council. Just compare building technology with NVIDIA. And just think about how in one case, like there's been a sea change in everything, and in the other one, like we're kind of doing what we did in 1962, and we're doing it worse. Yeah. Okay, so there, uh, we've got a question here from Alan. Wait, you've got the microphone right there, and then Alan after, after that. This one first? At least, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor, recently you, along with Mayor Breed, uh, the mayor of Santa Monica and mayors of San Diego, endorsed some amendments to state laws yeah. that specifically deal with hard drugs like fentanyl and the rampant retail theft crisis. Um, I was very grateful to see you take that pragmatic approach. Can you talk a little bit about what it is, what are the policies that you think need to be changed? Sure, yeah, happy to do that. And you're right, uh, Mayor Breed and I stepped out on the same day and announced our support for Prop 47 reform in particular. This is really the DA's area of expertise, but I'll share a couple of thoughts and then she can offer the rebuttal. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm interested in reform, not repeal of Prop 47 for some of the comments the DA made earlier. I don't think we want to go back to the era of mass incarceration. I think many of us were looking at our criminal justice system over the years and saying, there's something that isn't quite right here. We're locking up more people than almost any other place on earth. We're spending over $100,000 per person per year to keep people locked up. And we're not really rehabilitating or reintegrating people. And we ought to be able to do better in California. And so there were a number of well-intended reforms that I think some of which have had a very positive impact. But there are a couple things that we've seen that are real gaps that we need to address. The one that I'm most interested in addressing with Prop 47 reform is that we took away many of the incentives for engaging voluntarily in drug court and actually in making a real effort to, DA talked about accountability for taking advantage of services. What we've seen since the passage of Prop 47 is partic participation in our drug courts has plummeted, overdoses have skyrocketed. And of course, there's you know, fentanyl coming onto the scene. There are a lot of different variables here. But I have talked to our judges who say that they used to be able to say to somebody, you know what, for, for, for your good and the good of the community, you've got a choice. Go enroll in treatment and prove to me that you're serious about it or go spend some time in jail. And it seems it's gotten a lot harder to do that. And some people have quibbled, and the DA can clarify, well, the judges still have some discretion. But I think we have consistently, in recent years, sent signals to judges that we don't want to see anybody locked up for any kind of drug-related crime. And I think what we're seeing is, without any accountability, people are just not choosing to engage in drug treatment. We, we, we have to have some carrots and sticks here. So that's one part of it. On retail theft, uh, I, I think that it has to be, one, it should be cumulative, that $950 threshold for it becoming a fentanyl. That's one of the reforms that we are supporting. You'd be able to add up multiple instances to get to that 950 level. You would also, after a third offense, it would become a jail eligible um, felony charge. So that sort of repetition, I'm all for second chances, but if you're given you know, third, fourth, fifth chances, maybe it should come with some real consequences, like doing some jail time at some point if you're refusing to change your behavior. And of course, it has to be said that we do need to do a better job of investing in our inpatient treatment programs and offering people viable treatment options. We've got to do a better job of job training and job placement. I mean, I really do believe that we have to do a better job of empowering people to reintegrate in society, but the answer can't be 
we're just gonna take away any of the consequences and hope for the best. It kind of reminds me of what we did with our mental health system, where we deinstitutionalized and didn't really invest in, in adequate alternative interventions. And we've, done, we've just done the same thing with our criminal justice system. So anyway, I think the reforms, you can find them online, but basically cumulative penalties for repeat offenders and accountability for getting treatment uh, if, you're, if you're seriously addicted to hard drugs and classifying fentanyl as a hard drug and being able to prosecute those who are selling it with the uh, stiffer penalties that would come along with that. But uh, DA, what did I miss? No, no, you, you're, you're getting it right. Um, what most people don't talk about in conjunction with Prop 47 is that um, not only were more crimes um, reduced down to misdemeanors, which of course the mindset was that we not saddle people with felonies um, who then can't get jobs for committing what we would consider lower level crimes or nonviolent crimes, um, but uh, Several years later, our California state legislature then enacted legislation that made almost all of our misdemeanor crimes diversion eligible by statute. So most people say, well, what's diversion? Diversion is a really watered down version of um, an alternative to incarceration. It could be that a judge or, or a prosecutor says you have to go take 10 theft classes, right? 10 anger management classes. We've had judges say, as long as you don't get arrested in the next three months, that satisfies diversion. We will dismiss your case and seal your record. Um, and so when you both grow the number of misdemeanors, but then water down what is the consequence for a misdemeanor, we've lost all of our teeth. And so what used to be the case where we as prosecutors could walk in and make an offer that was, okay, you're facing you know, six months in jail, a year in jail, whatever it is, you can take that route, that punitive route, or you can go and engage in treatment. Well, now there's no punitive route hanging over their head. So why would I, go, why would I take, uh, you know, agree to go to some onerous treatment program when there's really no alternative that you, that you can hang over me? Even if we go to trial, particularly in San Francisco, we have a, a vast amount of judicial activism um, going on where the judges, even after trial, won't send someone to jail. That's not their ideological belief system. And so again, without that stick, people just keep doing what they're doing. And so I think one of the things that I've been trying to highlight all over San Francisco is that a lot of things happen under our noses, right? People had to bubble that, that, that ballot in to pass Prop 47. Nobody knew what diversion, you know, statutory diversion was and that our legislature was doing that. Um, and so they've been wondering, well, people keep committing these misdemeanors, and, and why, are, why aren't you, Madam Prosecutor, doing anything about it? Um, and so I've really been trying to educate people on really how there's, it's a multifaceted situation that has gotten us to where we're at. Okay, so I think we gotta wrap. I see more, many friends who still, who still have questions, so many good things. Hopefully you can come up and ask a, a couple of questions of our panelists, but please join me in thanking them.